Welcome to the lab lecture for Bio 120 l the microbiology lab. Um, in this lecture, we're going to be discussing the uh, activities that you're going to be doing on week eight. And we're going to basically be continuing experiment 3B as well as beginning experiment six. So on Monday, you're going to perform period two of experiment 3B. And on Wednesday, you're going to perform period three of experiment 3B. And on Wednesday as well, you start with the first period of experiment six. On Friday, you're going to have a quiz as well as the lecture that where we're going to explore the difference between the results section and the discussion section of a paper. So now, in experiment 3B, you're getting ready to start up the biochemical test. Um, last week, you inoculated a master plate with bacteria like this one over here. And in this week, you're going to separate into groups of four students and use the um, replica plating technique to print seven uh, different plates. You're going to have two different groups just because one simple uh, stamping doesn't have sufficient bacteria to do all 14 plates. So when you do this uh, and you present this analysis, just fuse these two groups together. It's just one experiment. You're just going to perform it into groups, but it's just one single experiment. So on group one, you're going to have a mineral salt agar, which is your basic uh, defined media, no sugar. And you're going to add to another one acetamide, another one with maltose, another with lactose, fructose, and glucose. And you're going to have a YTA plate as a positive control. On group two, you're going to have, after re resetting the plate one more time, you're going to have a second mineral salt agar plate, that's your negative control, um, p-hydroxyl benzoate, glycine, nicotinate, geranial, which is actually very volatile, and you're going to add the liquid to the lid and invert it into the plate directly, and the amino acid tryptophan as well as the YTA plate. So all these plates, after you have uh, printed them down, you're going to incubate them at um, 30 degrees because that's the temperature where the pseudomonas are going to be the happiest. So again, when you put this data together, this is one experiment. So you can put them in one table with only one control and one uh, YTA plate uh, positive control. So you can only have to report one control in both of them. So you also are going to take your cells from a YTB plate and inoculate different biochemical tests to evaluate enzyme activities. And as we discussed in class, enzyme activities could be a proxy for genetics. If a microorganism has the enzyme to perform a biochemical reaction, it means that it has the gene encoding that enzyme. So these are going to be the starch hydrolysis test, the gelatin hydrolysis test, and the lecithin reaction. All these three are therefore experiments to determine if the microbes are able to break down starch, which is a polymer of glucose, to break down gelatin, which is a protein, and to break down lecithinase, which is a um, phospholipid. You're also going to look for anaerobic respiration, looking at the reduction of nitrate. So as we discussed in lecture, um, nitrate could be an electron acceptor in um, an oxygenic respiration. So you're going to check for that in the nitrogen reduction reactions. You're also going to evaluate if the bacteria is producing pigments. And you're also going to do an experiment to, def to tell the amount of growth at 4 degrees and 42 degrees, and you're going to compare that growth to 30 degrees. So all these plates are going to also be incubated at 30 degrees, of course, except the ones at 4 and 32 degrees, I mean 42 degrees, excuse me. And you're going to then inoculate a YTA bacteria, you're going to use, excuse me, some YTA bacteria to make a glycerol stock. That stock will be frozen in case that you need to use it later, and we can then test it in further classes. So just to remind you, um, so far in many classes, you have learned about glycolysis as the way that many microorganisms break down 
glucose into pyruvate, but I want to show you a different pathway which is used by Pseudomonas, and that is the Ebner Dudorov pathway. So Pseudomonas cannot do glycolysis, which is called the Ebner Meyerhoff Partners pathway. So instead of calling it by the names of all the scientists who discovered the pathway, now we call it glycolysis. And we continue using the Ebner Dudorov pathway to distinguish it from glycolysis. So anyway, the Ebner Dudorov pathway also produces two pyruvate molecules that are eventually going to go to the Krebs cycle or whatever their other pathway, but they do it in a different way. Glucose is going to be uh, phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate, just like in glycolysis, but that's where it stops the similarities. So glucose is going to donate its electrons and be oxidized to 6-phosphogluconic acid, and in that same reaction, reduce NADP plus to NADPH. Now, that 6-phosphogluconic acid will have a hydrating reaction, and that is going to be turned into 2-keto-3-deoxy-6-phosphogluconic acid. When this 6-carbon molecule is split, you will immediately produce hyperubic acid and a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. That glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate will now go through the steps 6 and 10 of glycolysis to produce another pyruvic acid. But in that process, you're going to also generate 1 NADH and 2 ATP. So the output of the etner dudorov pathway is as follows. 2 pyruvates, 1 ATP molecule, 1 NADH molecule, and 1 NADPH molecule. And yes, you get 2 pyruvic acid, but you're going to get very different uh, output of electron carriers. So now that you have that information, I want to bring to your attention how I would like you to set up the hydrolysis test and the pigment uh, plate organization. I want you to set up your plate in a similar fashion to this picture shown over here, where you're going to divide your plate into three or sometimes four regions. And you're going to label those regions with the appropriate microorganisms, the isolate, the unknown, and the control. Include the control name, of course, as your plate ID, so you know which plate you're looking at, your name, the date, and you make a single streak of bacteria just along the length. Make sure that that single streak is nowhere close to the border of the plate so it doesn't contaminate or grow into the next microorganism. So in this particular example, I have one streak for my isolate, one streak for the unknown, and one streak for the control bacteria. And this is how we should look after the reactions has happening. This is the example of the starch hydrolysis, which is measuring the ability of the cell to produce amylases or enzymes that hydrolyze starch into glucose. Starch uh, turns blue-black when it reacts with iodine. So since there is starch in the media, if you add iodine to the plate, you're going to have a transient reaction where the red-brown color is going to happen. So in this particular example, you can see that around the E. coli, there is brown, black uh, all over the place. But if the bacteria is secreting amylases, you now have an area of clearing around the colony of bacteria. So this is one of the reasons you can see that here in Bacillus subtilis, that is the positive control, that the area of clearing uh, got very close to the Pseudomonas fluorescent site over here on the right. So that's why I want to make sure that that single streak of bacteria is sufficiently far away so that it doesn't uh, contaminate the next microorganism. So what you're going to do is to add iodine to your plate and swirl the plate around to cover the entire surface of the plate with iodine and then bring out the presence of the starch. And within a couple of minutes, you should take a picture of your plate to show the hydrolysis. And it is useful if you use, for example, a white paper in the back because the area of clearing will be very evident at that point. And one thing that I want you to warn you, 
this color fades also very quickly. So when you add the iodine, get the reaction going and immediately take your picture and score your plate. So you're going to use your isolate and your unknown and as a positive control, you're going to have Bacillus subtilis. Gelatin hydrolysis tests a very similar reaction, but it's going to be looking for the release of proteolytic enzymes, proteins that can cut proteins into peptides or amino acids. Now, in here, the proteins in the media are transparent, so we need to bring them out to be able to see them in a similar way that we did with the starch hydrolysis plate. So what we're going to add is trichloroacetic acid to the undigested protein plate, and that is going to make a cloudy area where the proteins are present. As you can see from this plate, where the bacteria releasing a proteolytic enzyme into the environment, that area will be clear around the colony and you will see a border where the protein is still available. So you're looking for a clear zone around the organism. So for this, I suggest using a dark background so you can see the contrast between the fuzzy area where the protein is present and the clear area where the protein has been digested. And again, you're going to do the, your quadrants, um, your triangle, so you can put your isolate and your unknown, and you're going to use Bacillus subtilis as a control for your reactions. The last reaction of this faction is going to be the egg yolk agar and lestine hydrolysis. And what you're looking now is for the presence of phospholipases, which are enzymes that can break down phosphatidylcholine, any phospholipid. And as you know, one of the main products of the phospholipid hydrolysis is fatty acids. Fatty acids are non-soluble, and therefore they're going to precipitate around the colonies, forming a waxy area. So you can see here in this Clostridium botulinum area, you have the colony of Clostridium in the middle, and around it you have an area of wax, and that wax comes from the fatty acids released from the phospholipids phospholipids after the phospholipids have done their job. Here the same reason, you have this large streak of bacteria and you're looking for that area of precipitation around the bacteria that is producing a film of wax from the fatty acids. So you're looking for large long fatty acids between carbon 16 and carbon 18, in this case it's going to be carbon 18 from the lestine hydrolysis, creating that waxy area around the colony. You're going to inoculate your isolate and your unknown, and here you're going to have Pseudomonas fluorescence as your positive control. Now the next reaction that you're going to perform, it's the reaction to the respiration of nitrate via denitrification. So you're going to, you recently learned that in the lecture, so we're going to put it into play. We're going to look for the capacity of the bacteria to reduce nitrate to nitrite or to reduce nitrate to nitrogen gas. Either of those two reactions will be considered positive. And what we're going to do is that we're going to add a reagent that if nitrite is available, it will turn the media red. It's called a nitrate reagent. I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, it doesn't really matter for the purpose of our experiment. But if the bacteria in this anaerobic conditions is using nitrate as an electron acceptor, it will reduce nitrate to nitrite. And therefore, the nitrite reag reag reagent excuse me, will turn the media red. The other part is that some bacteria are going to complete the denitrification reaction to produce dinitrogen or nitrogen gas. So you can see bubbles. So the reaction will be positive if you either have gas formation, indicating nitrogen formation, or a red color after adding the nitrite reagent for your reaction. And in this particular experiment, you're going to have tubes and you're going to have your isolate and your known as well as Pseudomonas acidovorans and Pseudomonas fluorescence as controls. And just to remind you, this is just a description of the denitrification uh, reactions here from Pseudomonas suitseri, where nitrate is going to be reduced to nitrite and eventually nitrite to nitric oxide nitric oxide to nitrous oxide, and then dinitrogen. 
So you're looking at this reaction and either the production of nitrogen gas here at the bottom or the production of nitrite here, which is conveniently looking red, it's also going to be considered a positive result. The other reaction that you're going to be looking is the production of pigment. And bacteria of Cisomonas can produce two different pigments, which are actually siderophores, uh, molecules, as you know, in charge of uh, chelating iron. So what you're going to do is that you're going to grow your bacteria and let the bacteria grow and then you're going to put them under UV light to see the presence of either pyoverding or pyocyanin. Pyoverding is kind of gray in color and it will fluoresce beautiful under the fluorescent light once you put it under UV. And pyocyanin is actually bright blue, so you will be able to see it with the naked eye, but it will also be very evident under UV light. So we usually use King's medium for this because King's medium is uh, a good medium with low iron to be able to bring out the production of the siderophores. So you're going to again inoculate your unknown and your pseudomonas and you're going to have pseudomonas originosa as one control and pseudomonas fluorescence as the other. So I will let you uh, hypothesize which pigment will be produced by these controls. So which pigment is produced by pseudomonas originosa and what pigment is produced by pseudomonas fluorescence. Now on Wednesday, after you set all your plates, you're going to score them. And this is what we're going to go over now. So the carbon substrate analysis, I want you to record the presence or absence of growth in your unknown bacteria and your isolate. But I want you to compare that to the YTA and the MSA control plate. So YTA is your rich media. Everything should be able to grow in there. You can give that the maximum growth. If you scored it in a 1 to 10 scale, that could be, for example, your 10. MSA should be your minimal media, no carbon source. The bacteria should have little to no growth in that media. That could be your zero or your one. And then you will then estimate the amount of growth by the size of the colony based on the other carbon sources that you're providing. So you can do a percentage, you can do a one to 10 scale, you can do plus signs for something that is uh, um, three or I mean five plot signs for something that is extremely strong grower and one plus sign for something that is weak it is up to you uh, but look that in the manual in page 91 and 94 in the manual the bacteria are going to be cataloged in growth based on percentages so you could use a percentage scale or a 1 to 10 scale to approximate that so I want you to make your life easy and compare that to that so that will be the scoring of the carbon structure the carbon substrate analysis plate. The starch had, uh, hydrolysis, you need to add the iodine, otherwise you won't be able to determine if the bacteria has secreted the amylases. So add the iodine, let it stand for about a minute, swirl your plate and score. Do not let it last longer than a couple of minutes because it will go back to being clear and you won't be able to have the reaction again. In the gelatin hydrolysis, now you have to add the tricolor acetic acid, and that will let you visualize it. Again, use a dark background to be able to see it better. And the lecithinase reaction, you're going to look for that white waxy precipitate around the bacterial streak. If any of these tests give you an ambiguous result, don't despair, talk to your TA and we'll be able to do them later in the class to help you get a better result. Also on Wednesday, you're going to look at the tubes for growth. So you're going to look at the nitrate reduction reactions. And if you get bubbles, that is an evidence of nitrogen gas. But if you get a red color, that is the presence of nitrite. And either of those two results, nitrite, red color, or nitrogen gas, bubbles, it's a good result and should be counted as positive. And of course, you're going to look for the formant the formation of pigments, so put your plates directly under the UV light to see if you have a growth before you add your nitrate reagent to the plate. So place them over there. And then look at the turbidity. You have the tubes that you grew at different concentrations, with different, different temperatures, excuse me. So you have your tube at 
40 degrees, a tube at 30 degrees, and a tube at 42 degrees. Score that on a scale of 0 to 4. I, I, I recommend that you look at the 30 as your standard and see if the growth at 4 degree is equal or less and by what factor and if the growth at 42 is equal, greater or less and by what factor. Save the bacteria grown at 30 degrees because you're going to use it to inoculate your um, glycerol stocks. And this is how I will encourage you to properly label stocks. When I had my lab, this is why I, the way that I taught everybody to label their tubes. The cryotubes are these ones here at the bottom. They are designed to go into the minus 80 freezer or the liquid nitrogen freezer. And they have a silicon stock. Um, ring around the neck so they make a great seal and the liquid nitrogen doesn't get inside. So when you are um, labeling these plates, you have a little area of white, please use a very sharp, uh, very fine sharpie and put your name, your in first initial and your last name. Do not use your initials because there's other people in the class with the same initials and we will never know what it is. Of course, put your unknown uh, on it. If you have a number, give that to us. Put the date that you're um, doing your cryo preservation tube and as well put the term of the class. So for us, it's going to be something around 10.5. Well, first, it's going to actually be a little later now that I think about it. And with the fall 19 is the tube. If you're loose, if you're using Eppendorf tubes, which you're more familiar with, they will be the one and a half ml Eppendorf tube. You can do the same labeling. I recommend that after you label them with the Sharpie, you put tape around it if you have it available, uh, scotch tape to protect the writing from alcohol and other materials. And then you can put that in the freezer. The lab manual has the instructions of how to do the um, the uh, glycerol stock, but basically you're going to do a 50-50 dilution of the cells that are growing into 50% glycerol. Now, on Wednesday, you're going to also perform experiment 6, and this is going to be the plate looking at oxythrops and prototrops in a mixture of bacteria. So, what you're going to be doing is trying to categorize oxythropic bacteria. Mutants that have a deficiency in a biochemical pathway, and in our case, we're going to be looking at the biochemical pathways that are making amino acids. But in other fields, we can look at the pathways making nucleotides or carbohydrates or lipids or any of the other macromolecules that the bacteria could make. Bacteria that have all the genes to make every single one of those amino acids, for example, are called prototrophs because they can make everything. Now, this cartoon here shows an example of a biochemical pathway where you have a gene 1 encoding enzyme A, gene 2 encodes enzyme B, and gene 3 of this operon encodes enzyme C. If you provide the bacteria with substrates W, enzyme A will catalyze the reaction to convert substrate W to product X. X now becomes the substrate of enzyme B and the reaction is going to yield product Y. And product Y becomes the substrate of enzyme C, and enzyme C gives you the, uh, after the reaction, you get product Z. Product Z, whatever it is, an amino acid could then be used, for example, to make macromolecules. So that is the typical way of organization in bacterial genomes. The genes for one pathway are all kept together in an operon that gets turned on together so all the genes required in the pathway are made at the same time. But in oxytrops, what we have is a mutation. So for example here, my magic one zaps gene one and therefore now I do not have enzyme A. So because I cannot make enzyme A, even though I am provided substrate W, the biochemical pathway is stopped in the very first step, and therefore we will never get product Z, and therefore we cannot make the macromolecules. Only if we give um, intermediate X or intermediate Y, or actually the product of Z, can the bacteria now 
grow. And those are considered the gross factors that we had discussed in lecture that are needed by bacteria because they do not have a pathway, for example. So in that day, what you're going to get is a culture of bacteria that has one oxytroph in 200 bacteria. So it's a very rare possibility of mutation. And you're going to put that culture in GMA, which is the glucose minimal salt agar. But at the very top, you're going to have a very thin layer of white tea or the yeast tripton broth on the media. And that means that both wild type cells, the prototrophs and the mutants, the oxytrophs, are going to be able to grow because they are taking the nutrients from the white tea broth to grow. But eventually, the nutrients of the very fine layer of the white tea broth will be depleted and therefore the oxytroph will not be able to grow. Therefore the colonies are going to be very small. The prototrophs, when they continue growing, they're going to be larger in size because now they can use the glucose in the GMA media and the salts to make whatever they need and therefore they're going to grow larger. Now a word of caution about this. Remember if you have bacteria that are very close together, the colonies are going to be small. So make sure that when you're streaking your bacteria, you're looking for an area that doesn't have that many colonies. So the prototrophs that are real are going to grow small and, excuse me, are going to grow big. And the oxytrophs, the real mutants, are going to grow small. If you're looking and picking bacteria from an area where they're crowded, even the prototypes are going to be small. So you're going to be picking on the next week on, when, on Monday, you're going to be picking a lot of prototypes. So always look for an area where there are few bacteria, where the prototypes are growing as large colonies, and therefore the oxytropes are now very tiny, but I really mean tiny colonies, because eventually you're going to pick 40. So choose the very small colonies and eventually you're going to verify that they're real oxytrophs. And later in lab, you're going to determine which pathway they mutated. So we're going to be doing that over the span of a couple of weeks. And with that, we finish the lecture for the lab and hopefully enjoy your weekend and I will see you next week.